Okay, well, I think we'll uh, we'll get things underway because uh, we, we do have a very packed uh, agenda for this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on where you are. So welcome again uh, to this very first uh, public webinar on the UN Ocean Decade Vision 2030 process, where we're really delighted to see so many people online and see the interest for this process, which is going to be so integral to uh, to setting a, a future collective ambition for the, uh, for the Ocean Decade. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alison Clawson. I'm the Deputy Coordinator of the UN Ocean Decade, and I'm here with several of my, of my colleagues who will be uh, presenting throughout the webinar as well, including Nicolo Bassan, who many of you have uh, probably seen and heard um, around the Vision 2030 process. He's leading the coordination of that. And we're also very lucky to be joined by a number of the co-chairs from the different working groups for the Vision 2030 process who will be presenting and going into a little bit more uh, substance on, on the work that they've been doing so that we can get some initial feedback and, and dialogue about uh, about the process. Just when, one thing before we jump in, please note that the webinar is being recorded. Um, that we're having another session this afternoon, which is the, the same session for a different time zone, but we'll also put the two recordings up on the website so that those who couldn't join today are able to watch them. So if we can move ahead to the, to the first slide, please. Just a, a brief overview of what we're going to do this morning. We've got about an hour and a half. Um, and we really do want to try and leave a good portion of that time for interaction, questions and answers. We realize this is the, the first time that many of you are seeing and hearing about the details of the Vision 2030 process. So I think it's important that we that we leave time to, to get your feedback um, to help us shape the, the future of the process as it moves through. But we'll start with a, a brief welcome and overview, which is uh, which is what we're in now. Um, I'll give you a bit of a, a brief introduction of some of the objectives of the actual webinar. Um, what we're trying to achieve this morning, a very rapid presentation of, of the ocean decade um, and then sort of how this Vision 2030 process fits into the overall decade action framework, and then talk a little bit about the 2024 Ocean Decade Conference in Barcelona next year, because that, of course, is, is one of the key uh, milestones and, and deadlines for the Vision 2030 process. I'll then hand over to Nicolo and the working group co-chairs who will go into more detail about the process itself, um, what we're trying to achieve, how it's being implemented, how it's structured, who is involved, and then give you an update from each of the working groups um, on the progress and upcoming milestones for the for the particular work that they are doing. And then we'll move into the, the Q&A session, as I mentioned, um, and then, uh, then just go to some, some closing remarks and next steps, including how you can continue to be involved in, um, in, uh, in this process moving forward. So if we can move on to the to the next slide, please. Um, these this webinar, I mean, as I as I said, it's it's really the first time we've brought the Vision 2030 process to a to a broad group of stakeholders, even though many of you who are engaged in the decade have probably had some um, interaction with with different pieces of the process or uh, with 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 uh, with actors who are engaged in the different working groups, but it's really important that we start to talk more broadly about the Vision 2030 process with a broader group of stakeholders, and that's that's really the first objective of this webinar this morning. The Vision 2030 process, as you'll as you'll hear when Nicola goes into more of the details, is is really crucial to the future of the ocean decade. We're now three years into the implementation. We have an extremely strong um, portfolio, foundation of decade programs, of decade projects, um, all working together around the Ocean Decade challenges. But the aim of the decade was always to be able to adapt and refine and continue to remain the most relevant um, as possible in a, in, a, in a dynamic context. And that's what this Vision 2030 process is really trying to do. It's really trying to take stock of where we are and set future priorities for the decade. And we can only do that with very broad stakeholder engagement um, and dialogue around what those common priorities should be. So that is the, the overriding objective of this webinar, which really starts off a process of broader stakeholder engagement. We will use um, this webinar also to, as I, as I mentioned, the, the working group co-chairs will present some of the initial outputs of the white papers so that, as you'll hear, the Vision 2030 process is structured around a series of 10 white papers um, that are being developed, one for each of the Ocean Decade Challenges. So we'll be showcasing some of those initial outputs, collecting initial inputs and feedback um, 
on the process itself, the working groups, um, the white papers, and then setting out really the process for further detailed engagement. So making sure that you know how you can continue to be involved in this process uh, moving forward, both leading up to the Barcelona conference next year, but also during the Barcelona conference and then following the Barcelona conference as well, because as the name indicates, this is really a process. Um, it's not a, it's not just a discrete activity, it's something that's going to continue over over the um, over the life of the decade. So if we can move on to the next slide, many of you will have seen this before. It is our, our very classic um, graphic of the Ocean Decade Action Framework, where we uh, have the, the, the broad theory of change of moving from the ocean we have to the ocean we want um, and doing that through the decade actions that are identifying required ocean knowledge, uh, generating required ocean knowledge, and then really using that ocean knowledge um, and, and using that ocean knowledge to meet one or more of the 10 ocean decade challenges. And you can you can see those challenges there. And we do we do focus a lot on these decade challenges because they really are the key action and entry points for the ocean decade. And you'll remember that they're they're structured around knowledge and solutions challenges, so around uh, more thematic challenges around pollution, ecosystems, sustainable blue food, sustainable ocean economy, ocean climate nexus. There are also decade challenges around infrastructure, so community resilience and coastal resilience, uh, ocean observations, uh, the digital ecosystem of the decade, and then there are these more foundational challenges around capacity development, around ocean literacy, the cultural values of the ocean, indigenous and, and, and local knowledge. So we have, have this, as I said, a very robust uh, portfolio of decade actions. We have 47 programs, close to 280 projects, um, hundreds of activities, different contributions of in-kind and financial resources, all working towards achieving these these decade challenges and where we're just putting the finishing touches now on the progress report from the last year which will give you some additional um, statistics and figures around the number of individuals and research institutes that are really engaged in the decade and all of this is you know really re-emphasizes that point that with this huge foundation and momentum that is happening within the decade there is a growing need to really be able to to structure, to create uh, a collective ambition and way forward around these ocean decade challenges. And this is where the Vision 2030 process comes in. We currently have a good uh, process, although we can always improve it, but a, a good process for monitoring and tracking the decade actions themselves. We have other initiatives underway um, led by IOC UNESCO through the State of the Ocean Report, the store, which is looking at tracking progress and, and narratives around the decade outcomes, which are those aspirational goals. But the missing piece is how are we really setting ourselves indicators, targets, milestones for the decade challenges, and then tracking progress against those to 2030. And that is really where the the Vision 2030 process comes into, into play. And Nicola will show you how we've structured this process so that we can we can really meet that ambition and really focus on that piece around the Ocean Decade Challenges. We can just move on to the next slide. So all of this, as I alluded to, is, is really going to well, we're we're in a process now where we're in a in a you know a relatively short lead up now to the 2024 UN Ocean Decade Conference, which is being very generously hosted by the Spanish government in Barcelona uh, in April next year. There is actually a full Ocean Decade Week from the 8th to the 12th of April, and the conference itself will be the 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 highlight or the culmination of that week from the 10th to the 12th of April. And, and the link between this conference and, and the Vision 2030 process is, is very strong. This conference is one of a series that will be held every three years. The first conference, the kickoff conference, many of you will remember, was held in June 2021 um, as, a, as an online event because of the COVID pandemic. So this is the first in-person um, gathering of the Ocean Decade community, but more broadly as well, because it's not restricted only to existing Ocean Decade partners. And it's it's really a conference to, you know, as as I said, to 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 be able to look at the ocean decade, to adapt, to refine, and 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 to to set a collective vision. So we'll be certainly taking stock of achievements so far, but then also using the results of the Vision 2030 process as really the core 
of many of the discussions at the UN Ocean Decade Conference next year to set a collective ambition for the 10 Ocean Decade Challenges moving forward. So there'll be the presentation of the white papers, there'll be different plenary and parallel um, sessions around these so that we can get broad dialogue during that conference um, in, into the, to the, to the Vision 2030 process and into those, into those white papers. So if we can move to the next slide, just to give you a very brief overview of what um, of what the the program for the actual conference looks like, and this is on the uh, the conference website, and I hope one of my colleagues may be able to just pop the conference website um, link into the into the chat box. But you can see. Um, how the conference is structured over, over the three days, a, a relatively standard, I guess, mix of plenary and parallel sessions. The four sessions that you can see with the colored uh, titles there, session one through four, are really the sessions where we're going to dig into the results of the Vision 2030 process. So we've grouped the different Ocean Decade challenges together. And these four sessions, um, and you can see the, the different challenges there, will again be a mix of plenary sessions for, followed by parallel sessions. There will be oral presentations. There will be workshopping and dialogues where we will be presenting and where the, the, the co-chairs of the working groups and the working group members will be presenting and really leading a discussion on the white papers, the outcomes of the white papers, papers of the Vision 2030 process and seeking your feedback and input so that following Barcelona, we can finalize and refine these papers and then look at how we put the recommendations of the white papers into operation. So this, these dates, 10th to 12th of April, are you know, a pretty immutable deadline in the Vision 2030 process, but we certainly need your engagement and your involvement in the lead up to Barcelona, and then hopefully your engagement and involvement during the Barcelona conference as well. Um, just a couple of notes on Barcelona while I still have the floor, um, just to also let you know that the call for posters and oral presentations was released yesterday, uh, will be open till the beginning of December. So please have a look on the Decade Conference website um, or on our social media to, to get more information on the calls for posters and, and oral presentations. And to let you know that the uh, also the call for satellite events um, closed this week, and we had an overwhelming, overwhelming response to that with hundreds of, of submissions for satellite events. So if you did submit a satellite event, just to let you know, um, you'll probably expect to hear something from us in December about um, satellite events, because of course there will be a range of satellite events before and during the, the conference and registration for the conference itself will open in early, early December. So keep an eye on the Decade, web, uh, Decade website and the conference website for all of that. But just again, to highlight the importance of this conference uh, for, for really being a key moment in the, in the Vision 2030 process. And with that, hopefully that gives you a, a, an introduction to sort of where we're coming from for, with this process in the context of, of the decade at a, at a more strategic level and how it fits into the um, to the Ocean Decade Conference in Barcelona and how we'll be using that Barcelona event to really further the process. And with that, I will hand over to, to Nicolo Bassan, the Ocean Decade Science Officer, who will go into to more detail about the, the structure and the way that the process is being run. Um, with the uh, with the different working groups. So over to you, Nicolo. Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm I'm gonna briefly um show you the process as Alison was mentioning of the Vision 2030 process. Um, to give more space, of course, to the co-chairs that will then go into details of their specific working groups and and challenges. Um, as Alison was mentioning, the Vision 2030 process um aims to set a strategic ambition for each of the decade challenges, um, and this came from a strong demand also from the decade community to shape this common vision for the next eight years and uh, and um, enhance and boost collective impact towards this this common vision um so this is a very unique opportunity to actually co-design and um, and um, uh, work together towards the science we need and avoid any overlapping um, between decade actions but actually um, trying to find synergies and boost collaboration among them. Um, there's, of course, a growing need to measure and document impact of the ocean decade, and that's why also the strategic ambition is um, fundamental for this process. And as you can see on the on the right side of the screen, uh, the strategic ambition is made of of different elements, one of which is the uh, understanding the priority that sets to unlock and generate, but also the technology and innovation solutions. 
uh, or an infrastructure for data and knowledge generation, the knowledge, uh, knowledge to generate and share, but also partnership and resources, capacity development and exchange needs, and of course, indicators to measure progress towards that. Um, so the Vision 2030 process will answer the question, uh, what does success look like um, for this um, for these specific ocean decade challenges at the end of the decade, but also what milestones and targets do we need to achieve throughout the decade to be on path for success for, for these challenges. Um, just a brief um, slide on, on the numbers of the Vision 2030 process. As you can see, we have 10 working groups for the 10 challenges. Um, more or less 50 countries are represented among the different co-chairs, but also the members of the different working groups. Uh, we have 21 ECOPs involved, uh, 20 co-chairs, so two for each working group. Um, more or less 40 actions involved in um, in the um, in the members of the working groups, uh, which are more or less 150 experts with 26 supporting staff um, helping them in this uh, in this process. Um, as Alison was mentioning, uh, for Barcelona, we'll have uh, these white papers um, in which the strategic ambition will be set and then commonly discussed during Barcelona to have this common vision uh, consolidated and then operationalized in uh, in a second stage. As you can see, the white paper layout will be between seven to 10 pages white paper, very brief, um, but right to the point, uh, with an executive summary, an introduction, uh, the strategic ambition setting, which is the core of the white paper and the Vision 2030 process, and then the milestones and indicators. Um, we will then move to the public review process once the working groups have uh, um, have actually um, structured these white papers. We'll move to the public review process, which will be um, between January and February. Uh, so please reach out if you would like to public uh, to review. Sorry, um, one of the white papers if you're interested in one specific challenge, and we can uh, then send out the um, the invite for the review process. And this will be between January and February 2024. Then the white papers and the synthesis report will be presented and discussed at the second International Ocean Decade Conference in April 2024. And th these will be consolidated and an operational plan will be developed to implement and operationalize the strategic ambitions for each of the decade challenges. Um, how to engage? Um, of course, you can get involved through targeted consultations with specific working groups if you're interested in specific challenges, but you can participate also in the open review process of the white papers. You can join the 2024 Ocean Decade Conference, and if you submitted, of course, some um, side events, um, we would be happy also to discuss any opportunity of collaboration during those side events. You can share the Vision 2030 process during events and collect any feedback from your um, different professional and personal um, networks and communities. And you can contact the coordination team. We'll share these in the chat with you, the contacts of, um, of me and, uh, and all the colleagues that are following this. So without further ado, I would then pass the word to the co-chairs, which will have four minutes to introduce um, their progress and um, um, the way forward for, for their working group. We'll start with challenge one which is understand and beat marine pollution. Uh, and we have the two co-chairs uh, co following this challenge, which are Rosemary Rafus, which is a professor of international law at the University of New South Wales, and Vanessa Hattier, which is a professor in chemical oceanography at the Federal University of Bahia. So without uh, further ado, um, I'll leave the floor to Rosemary. So Rosemary, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nicolo. Um, I... I mean, I've got the privileged position of getting to go first. Um, I can't turn on my video, unfortunately, but that's that's all right. Uh, working group one, our challenge is a fairly important one. It's to understand and map land and sea-based sources of pollutants and contaminants and their potential impacts on human health and ocean ecosystems, and to develop solutions to remove or mitigate them. Now, one of the first challenges we have, of course, is to define what we mean by marine pollution. And we already have a definition in the... Um, United Nations Law of the Sea Convention that tells us that marine pollution can be caused by the introduction by humans of any substance or energy 
into the marine and estuarine env environment from any source. And that introduction can be either direct or indirect. And that introduction must then result or be likely to result in harm to marine life, hazards to human health, impairment of water quality or interference with marine activities. So it's not the intrinsic quality of the substance that is relevant and it's not the source, whether it comes from a terrestrial source or a marine or atmospheric source that is of primary concern. And of course, we have a vast range of actual and potential pollutants that exist, including chemicals, biologically active substances, wastes, products like oil and gas and plastics, as well as light and noise. Um, but that, in fact, the, the list is endless. And today we have things like caffeine and sunscreen, which are emerging as pollutants. What is really important is the actual or potential impact that the introduction of a substance has on marine ecosystem services and functions and how that affects humans and human health. Now, Interestingly, of course, marine pollution is not only a threat in its own right, but it can also be seen as a threat multiplier, which reduces the resilience of marine ecosystems, uh, making them less able to weather the shocks that are caused by other processes like overexploitation, for example, overfishing or climate change. Now, our understanding of the ocean uh, is continuing to improve, but our scientific knowledge of the sources and in particular the impacts of marine pollution on the marine environment remains fairly limited. And addressing these knowledge gaps is crucial for our understanding of marine pollution and its cumulative long lasting effects on human health and ecosystem functioning. And that's what lies at the core of Working Group One's work. Now, like all the working groups, our membership includes a diverse, globally, uh, geographically representative group of individual experts, as well as institutional members and representatives of a number of decade programs, actions and partners. And so we have a very large number of people participating. Um, what we've done, well, we're working mostly online. We've got through the distribution of questionnaires. Uh, to members of the working group and their colleagues, which have then been followed up by online meetings and discussions. And we started by identifying what can best be described as a wish list of the best case scenario, all the wonderful things we would like to see done uh, to uh, solve the problem of marine pollution. Um, but of course, that wish list is far too long and far too unrealistic to be achieved within one decade. So we've paired it back to our list of uh, priorities and things that we're focusing on specifically right now are the uh, data sets that are missing. I think if you change to the next slide, Nicolo, uh, the data sets that are missing, what we can um, add to the science, uh, uh, establishing baselines and criteria for what constitutes a risk and how do we assess that risk, looking at issues relating to the need for regional networks for monitoring and observation, and of course, the issue of developing predictive models to enable risk assessment of new and emerging chemicals and other potential pollutants. So looking at screening systems that can be developed. And as each of the working groups go through their presentation, I think you're going to see there will be significant overlap between what working group one is doing and what a number of the other working groups are doing. And we hope to be working together with them to consolidate our um, white papers and consolidate the information that we're presenting. So we are currently in the process of identifying the relevant elements of our priorities for more detailed analysis and consultation together with milestones and indicators by which success in meeting uh, these priorities can be assessed. And we're working on the first draft of our white paper as we speak. Now, Nicolo has already mentioned a number of opportunities uh, for um, you, who are on this webinar and others uh, to contribute to the work of our working group and other working groups um, participating in these webinars, engagement with individual working group members uh, through the peer review process, attendance at the Ocean Decade Conference. But working group one is particularly fortunate to have as one of its members, the Back to Blue Initiative, which is an initiative of the Economist and the Nippon Foundation, who are working on co-designing a roadmap aimed at closing the marine pollution data gap. Their work directly supports our work. They contribute to us, we contribute to them. And in that respect, the Back to Blue are holding what they call a hackathon, which is going to commence at the end of next week and run for six weeks, 
where they are inviting members of the public, uh, scientific communities, policy communities, anyone who is interested from around the world to contribute um, through um, answering certain questionnaires that they will have posted on their website, which will then feed into their development of the roadmap, which is something that we are working with them on and constitutes one of our, um, shall we say, one of our milestones as well. And so the best way that you can contribute right now is to engage with the Back to Blue Hackathon. As I said, it starts next week. It will run for six weeks. The website for it, the web pages and the information have not yet gone live. They should go live next Thursday. But in the meantime, you can check out uh, information about Back to Blue on their website, backtoblueinitiative.com. And I would highly recommend that you do that because in doing that, we do not then have to duplicate that process. We won't be asking you twice to respond to the same questions. Um, and you will be making a significant, wonderful contribution to our working group and I'm sure to other working groups as well. Thank you, Nicolo. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Um, we'll um, pass to working group two. So challenge two, to protect and restore ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, the two co-chairs are uh, Frank miller Carger, professor of oceanography at the University of South Florida, and Eileen Chao Huai, professor of oceanography at the University uh, St. Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, the two co-chairs could not attend today. So I'm gonna briefly um, bring you towards, um, through, sorry, the, um, the progress of the, of the working group two and the, the thematic, of course. So <clears throat> as you may know, Challenge two is on protecting and restoring the systems and biodiversity. And so to understand also the effects of multiple stressors on ocean ecosystems and develop solutions to monitor, protect, manage, and restore ecosystems and their biodiversity under changing environmental, social, and climate conditions. Um, working group two um, has worked as many other working groups uh, tirelessly during these, these uh, uh, months. And um, uh, their key messages, um, at least for for the time being, would be uh, that the strategic ambition would uh, enable wise management using timely, accurate information, but also uh, building on what exists and use existing global frameworks. So trying to integrate uh, research policy management in, um, in an operational framework and focusing on biodiversity indicators and best practices. Um, of course, the SDG 14 target, the global biodiversity framework, and the national requirements are the overall framework in which um, also Working Group 2 is working um, towards the co-design, um, towards a co-design approach for restoration, conservation, and development efforts. Um, the, the, the aim is to forecast biodiversity and, um, and ecosystem services in order to inform then policy and management actions, but also to better link um, the different processes in terms of observation and monitoring, which are currently um, running at an international stage, such as Goose, CBD, GEO, but also national, private, um, and research monitoring um, initiatives. Um, the best practices that were identified during these first months of, of work were um, having, of course, fair ethical and respectful interactions. Uh, the working group is uh, broad and geographically uh, well distributed with um, great gender balance, but also ECOPS and early researchers involved in the process. Um, it coordinated um, um, and um, it's also focusing on international capacity development um, in general. So I'm trying to understand how operations and jobs could be linked, but also on focusing on a common language. So um, linking the essential variables, such as essential ocean variables, climate and biodiversity variables, um, in order to have also a common shared and, uh, and um, um, useful language that could be used in terms of indicators. Um, of course, they would uh, they, they aim to follow fair and care principles for mobilizing biology and ecosystem data and using standard data formats and, and links to databases. The milestones for the next um, period will be to engage the UN Global Compact um, towards the Ocean Stewardship um, Coalition, uh, but also commit to a minimum set of common monitoring guidelines 
uh, as I was mentioning before, such as essential ocean variables and indicators, um, but also to best practices. So to have standard data formats and fair care by echo data. Um, the timeline, of course, it's a work in progress and it's towards the strict deadline of, of Barcelona. Uh, but there were many opportunities for participation. Um, the two co-chairs, you can see the contacts in this slide. They're very happy um, if um, if you would like to to reach out and uh, and try to engage um, within the working group. Um, and of course, they uh, propose proactive uh, ocean decade actions um, involvement that that can have also a broader impact besides the the members of the working group. Um, of course, participating in the Ocean Decade Conference, but also promote practices and, and key messages of, of the working group too. So um, for any other information on this, uh, of course, you could either um, connect again this afternoon or reach out to Frank and Eileen, which would be uh, for sure very happy in, in, uh, in engaging with, uh, with you. Um, we can move to working group three at this point. Um, challenge three, it's on sustainably feed the global population. And the two co-chairs are Vera Agostini, which is uh, Deputy Director of the FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Policy and Resources Division, and Eric Olson, which is um, Head of Research uh, of the Research Group for Sustainable Development, Institute of Marine Research in Norway. Um, I think Vera will be, will be speaking. So Vera, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicolò. Um, and I see that I cannot, I guess, come onto video, so I'll just do this verbally. Um, with the, you know, very nice to be here this morning. Um, working group three, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them, about us. So there are billions of people, I think we all realize, that depend on the ocean as a primary source of nutrition and livelihood. So this is what this working group three focuses on. It focuses on providing proposing solutions and future pathways to ensure that the ocean's resources can effectively nourish what we know is going to be an expanding global population. Now, transforming food systems is really at the heart of a lot of what we discuss uh, in this working group. It's, it's this, the importance of transforming food system has been highlighted at the international level. And when one considers, you know, at the bottom of the slide, you see the many SDGs that relate to aquatic food. So this is really reflected in the diversity of SDGs that touch on aquatic foods. Um, now, before I go too far, I wanted to just provide a couple of definitions because I've been told that the, the, the audience on this webinar is quite diverse. Some of you may not be a uh, science expert or aquatic food expert. So first I'll say that aquatic foods, when you hear that word, that really includes all edible aquatic organisms, including fish, shellfish, and algae from marine and freshwater production systems. Um, now the aquatic food system is all the elements and activities that relate to aquatic foods within, of course, the broader economic, social, and natural context. So the figure on the left slide really wants to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of work on aquatic food system. As you see there, you have nutrition, livelihood, environment, culture, and there's many other aspects. So really the food system, in order to understand the food system, one has to touch on all that. Now, working group three was established with 14 expert members, and all of us are from diverse fields ranging from food systems to ocean economics, because we really need that interdisciplinarity to really tackle this challenge and, and, and try to pr uh, put out some important recommendations for how we go forward. Um, now, so far, the working group has defined, one, defined the scope of challenge three, um, two, characterize the status of aquatic foods today, and three, identified key challenges and gaps. Now, regarding the scope, so the first elements that I mentioned, uh, we essentially highlighted, if you look at the top of the screen, their feed in the title, because one of the first elements that we all agreed in the working group was the need to expand the challenge from feed to nourish the global population given that the critical challenge is not just about feeding in the form of protein, which is often how people think about food, but also about health and nutrition. 
So nourish, nutrition becomes a really key part of the scope for this challenge. Now, the figure on the right side is also a good summary of the opportunities and challenges that aquatic food systems face and that were identified by the working group. Um, and the author of this paper, the lead author of this paper is on the working group. So this is really useful to have. Now, if you look at some of these icons, specific major challenges include, for example, Anthropocene generated pressure and ecosystem shift, pressures across the value chains and, and, uh, and other elements. Now, another thing that the working group did was identify key users of challenge three and their needs. Uh, and the working group found an important breadth and diversity of users relating to aquatic foods. So because of this, uh, providing a consistent and sufficient understanding of aquatic foods to a diverse set of users really becomes critical. And it's going to be a big part of our work and our recommendations. We also identified two key types of gaps for the decade to address when it comes to aquatic foods. The first are, of course, gaps in science. Um, and we produced a list, we're in the, in the process of producing a list of key areas where there remain some gaps that need to be addressed. But the second one is also an important one that relates to the uptake of existing extensive science into governance policy and management. There are some bright spots where this is happening well, but overall we find in our discussions, in our experience, that this is quite limited. Uh, so this is another gap that we feel the decade needs to address. Uh, next slide, please, Nicolo. Now, the working group's strategic ambition is aimed at describing the future we want for aquatic foods. So in this slide, I've highlighted four key elements of the strategic ambition for this working group. The first is to take an integrated approach to aquatic food system, including in the science. Um, aquatic foods are often not highlighted as a critical part of food systems which then of course leads to them being left behind and sometimes not integrated important conversations about the blue economy nutrition health and even planetary and environmental responsibility so we really need to take an integrated approach when we look at food systems and make sure that aquatic foods are in there the second element of course focuses on production and supply change which chains, which focuses not on how to produce more, but also how to produce smarter and better. Really, instead of more, it really should be smarter and better. So of course, in, within the context of this, there's a focus on supporting innovation and equity, because we believe that these are critical to progress. Now, the third part of the strategic ambition focuses on consumption. And you're seeing the elements that I'm talking about here illustrated in this slide. Consumption and gaps in aquatic food science relating to social and behavioral science, even though really social and behavioral science are also go beyond consumption. So we feel that there's it's important to look at this, look at how uh, social and behavioral science that are needed. Now, the final key element is the need for greater inclusion of small scale actors. Now, despite their importance, documentation and understanding are limited. And importantly, key small scale actors are often not included in management and policy. It is therefore critical for the ocean decade to focus on addressing these gaps. Now, I want to underline that this does not mean that we don't think that there should not be consideration for large scale production, but just that this is really an area that we feel needs to be very uh, um, that we need to highlight and that the decade should, should you know, focus on. Now, what I will call these thematic elements that I just went through, the four orange squares, are also complemented by cross-cutting targets and approaches that relate to knowledge transfer, innovation, and data. Um, now, in, in terms of next steps, and I'm almost finished here, um, we are, of course, focused on drafting the white paper supported by the feedback we receive here. And I note all the good advice that Nicolò has given about how to further engage. So we look forward to that. And we also hope to get FEEP engaged with other Vision 2030 working groups and actions, which we will be reaching out to in the next month or so. So thank you very much. And of course, we welcome any suggestions or comments you may have. Thank you very much, Vera. 
and um, we can move to um, working group four, um, which is on challenge four, develop a sustainable and equitable ocean economy with two co-chairs, which are uh, <clears throat> Peter Hogan, policy director of the Institute of Marine Research in Norway, and Andrew Rhodes, uh, coordinator of the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy. Um, I think Peter um, is in this session. So Peter, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Nicolo, and thank you for, for running this, this seminar this morning. Uh, as it says there, the, the objective is to, to generate knowledge, if I can go back to the, to, the, to, the, to the slide, support innovation and develop solutions for equitable and sustainable development of the ocean economy under changing environmental, social and, and climate conditions. And I'd like to also highlight uh, that we have sustainable and equitable ocean economy in the title here. Uh, next slide, please. What uh, this group of authors, uh, which we have collected, which is a very wide and diverse group and with many representation from around the world and from different processes, we spent a lot of time discussing uh, equi equity, actually. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to report that despite the, the very diverse authorships from representing different, different groups, uh, Equity is really a key for uh, for the, the, what we want to achieve with with the white paper and with uh, the discussion of where to take the decade when it comes to a sustainable ocean economy. Um, I've included a figure here to the right, uh, which is uh, taken from the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy and used repeatedly. And, and the message there is really key to many of our discussions and what we want to get out of, of this process. Uh, what it tries to say is that, that a sustainable ocean economy can only be achieved if we have a fruitful combination of effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity development for, for those who, who need to, uh, to, to, to develop in terms of their economic uh, prosperity. Uh, uh, a highlight is here that uh, these things are not uh, competing with each other or fighting for uh, for space or, or being sort of uh, uh, in, in con conflict, but they all have to work together. And when it comes to what is the ocean economy, uh, all uh, projections, uh, DNV and others of the development of the ocean economy says that all of the sectors from food production, energy production, shipping, uh, human activities in the coastal zone are going to increase considerably between now and 2050. This means that we have a challenge in making sure that this happens in a good and, and sustainable way and not just being economic activities that will actually uh, destroy the environment. <clears throat> so... Um, where are we? Uh, I have the first part of the uh, of the outline of the paper to the left here. I'm not going to go through that. We've discussed uh, where we are, uh, uh, what what uh, what the structure should be of the rest of the paper. Uh, something has been written. It's too long, but I think we are, are in agreement on on where we are going. And uh, uh, what we need is uh, an, an integral and holistic view of the sustainable use of ocean resources. And it's not only about the economic value. That, that's very key for us to make sure that uh, it's understood that this uh, challenge is about the holistic uh, human interaction with the ocean environment. Uh, and and in, in that way, it is also very uh, well linked to some of the other challenges. And it's, a, it's something that we need to work on from now on to make sure that we capture what's going on in some of the other challenges and that is reflected and consistent with what we are trying to achieve in this uh, part. We are discussing uh, key messages. If I could move to the next slide, um, we, uh, wh where you see the, the, uh, the, in particular the vision for 2030, where are we going? One thing that I think is very important for, for this particular challenge is that um, we talk about uh, the ocean we want. And of course, that's not only achievable by science. We have a tentative title on the white paper saying guiding the development. Um, but uh, we really need to work well together with, uh, with the policy level as well as the uh, private sector and, and society at large. Uh, it's about planning and regulation, it's about action, and it's about uh, various types of knowledge that need to be respected. Uh, and of course, practical and indigenous knowledge is part of that. So whereas uh, in many uh, branches of science that I've been involved in too, we tend to think in the, in the way of 
starting with science, going through uh, opportunities, uh, making government plans, and then having action happening. This is, uh, uh, I think, the, the development of a sustainable ocean economy. We have to work in the more uh, um, societal mission thinking, where actually societal goals come first, then we enable the activities, and then the demand for science is going to, um, uh, to, to come uh, from that. That's a discussion we're having. Um, I just wanted to uh, to close by by saying that where are we in terms of the vision? As per now, we have sort of four elements to the to the vision of the ocean economy. It should number one, it should be supported by accessible and comprehensive knowledge. Number two, it should be managed in an equitable manner and uh, with uh, local and indigenous knowledge integrated. Three, it should be accessible and equitable for current and future generations. And four, it should be underpinned by sustainable practices across industry. And these linkages are really important. Right now, things are happening, sustainable ocean planning and management. The IOC is running a consultation with member states. The UN Global Compact, which is well represented in our author group, is calling for, for societal actors to, to talk about that in the run-up to COP28. So our challenge now is to pick up all of the good things that are happening uh, also outside our group and make sure that we, we get that into the white paper in a good way. So if you have ideas or input, you don't hesitate to go directly to me. There are other avenues, but, but I'm receptive at any time. So with that, back to you, Nicolo. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much for... Um setting the that scene for working group four um we'll move to working group five which is on change five unlock ocean uh, based solutions to climate change and two co-chairs are uh, carol robinson professor of marine sciences at the university of east anglia and christopher sabine professor of oceanography at the university of hawaii at manoa um, i think we have um kirsten Eisenson, which is uh, supporting staff and a member of the working group, which will be representing the, um, the group today. So um, please, Kirsten, the um, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I somehow can't uh, turn my video on, but I, I guess that's okay. Um, so yes, I'm very happy to speak here to you on behalf of the coaches, uh, Carol Robinson and Christopher Subain, which are said to not be here, but Chris will uh, join the afternoon um, session. So challenge five, unlock ocean-based solutions to climate change. And the title itself is rather long and comprises a lot of issues, enhance understanding of the ocean climate nexus and generate knowledge and solutions. And uh, to mitigate, adapt and build resilience to the effects of climate change across all geographies and at all scales and to improve services, including prediction for the ocean climate and weather. So you have first uh, the understanding of the ocean climate nexus, then really knowledge and solutions to mitigate, adapt, and build resilience. And then, of course, this is as well connected to the prediction. So there are three big uh, parts, and therefore also um, it was important when um, comprising this working group that we uh, cover a huge variety of, of, of um, participants. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview about uh, the, the working group itself. Uh, we have uh, 15 members, plus me as support, uh, from 13 countries, nine female, six male, and really all career stages, and also different types of um, yeah, actors um, from different types of, of stakeholder groups, so from uh, yeah intergovernmental organizations, uh, um, also more uh, NGOs, uh, independent science organizations, and um, academia. But also really important is here to highlight that um, we we did strive for a good representation of different uh, yeah the the different areas in the world, uh, different, also the Global South. As we all know, the climate change is particularly um, harming um, yeah, the, the South and also developing countries. So that was a big um, yeah, look at that too. 
to have them included in this working group, um, to have everybody really represented equally. So um, this working group is also um, affiliated a little bit to another initiative by IOC, which more focuses on the carbon cycle. But here, as mentioned, uh, we are focusing on um, the, the science itself, the uh, adaptation, mitigation, and also building resilience and improving predictions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, the ocean climate nexus, of course, there are two ways um, to yeah, um, get ready or, or to react to climate change, which have to happen at the same time, while we have to work towards uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, there also needs um, to have them. It's most probably a need to increase carbon sequestration in the ocean or on land. Um, but this, um, yeah, have to uh, happen in, in parallel and still greenhouse gas emission reduction is the most effective one. Um, so, <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, while we are working on the mitigation, uh, one has to adapt, um, unfortunately. And so um, the group itself had a <clears throat> big list of uh, multiple pages of, of user needs and and uh, what would what society would need actually to um, adapt and, and mitigate. And of course, like also already said by working group one, um, one has to uh, prioritize. And so this is a little bit, um, where we are right now with the working group, we met twice and um, and I said that we had this long list of, of user needs and now we are really trying to uh, focus on the text for the common structure. There is already quite some text in there, but of course all that needs to be put as well in, in, um, in a common framework while now individuals are kind of uh, writing on their expertise. So, um, However, during this and, and for the uh, paper structure and, and also for you of, of hopefully of interest, what was identified as key mitigation approaches uh, are develop marine new, renewable energy um, as an alternative to fossil fuel derived energy, reduce marine pollution. This also connects very nicely to working group one, um, which is then hopefully as well helping to uh, increase the resilience of uh, the main ecosystems. We start to increase vegetation. Uh, this is particularly true for the uh, blue carbon uh, ecosystem and as well macroalgae. And then of course, uh, as well something um, of, of big interest for, for many, uh, the marine carbon dioxide removal, MCDR or OCDR, like it's also called. So um, evaluating the potential of nutrient fertilization to enhance plant productivity, including enhanced upwelling and seaweed farming, ocean alkalinity enhancement, carbon capture storage. Um, so we are really quite fortunate to have um, uh, many experts in that um, in that field in the working group, which hopefully then will also um, help putting that um, in the right spot here to see the potential and uh, also uh, some of the limitations. Then uh, adaptation approaches, of course, um, that as well relates a lot to, to many other uh, working groups. Um, so increased ocean literacy and awareness, co-design governance and cooperation between users, including local and indigenous communities, improved risk reduction policies, improved predictive capability of ocean climate and weather forecast. And I think, especially in that point as well, improving the, the knowledge base for um, enhanced um, predictions will be an, an important step over the next years, um, hopefully really helping to um, support the coastal communities and the, the ocean itself as well, the marine ecosystem in, um, yeah, and in, in, in being ready for, for the challenges ahead. Um, the milestones and indicators, it's actually really the most important part, I think, of this uh, these papers as well, and but also the most uh, 
a difficult uh, issue, I would say. So we are now, while we are working on this mitigation and adaptation approaches, which are in the core, if you so want, uh, based on that, we will then as well um, identify the mitigation, uh, the, the respective indicators and, and milestones uh, for it. Um, and as well, showing where the, within the um, UN decade, there's potential for further science for sustainability uh, really to, to be developed over the next years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And thank you for showing us the, the progress and, and the main elements of Working Group 5. We'll move to Working Group 6 um, on Challenge 6, which is increase community resilience to ocean hazards. And the two co-chairs are Nadia Pinardi, uh, Professor of Oceanography at the University of Bologna, and Srinivasa Kumar, Director of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services. I think um, Srinivas is here, so I'll give the floor to you, Srinivas. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nicolo, and then uh, good day, good afternoon, and good evening to colleagues. Uh, Nadia is going to join in the later session uh, today. Um, so uh, our challenge deals with uh, increasing community resilience to ocean hazards. And then uh, what we are actually trying to do there is to enhance multi-hazard early warning services for all uh, uh, ocean and coastal hazards and of course also mainstream community preparedness and resilience. So that's the challenge. And the working group itself, this working group six consists of uh, 20 members from 15 countries representing very researchers, universities uh, and uh, institutions and so on. There is varied expertise in the group uh, and uh, we have uh, a broad geographical uh, gender uh, and generational diversity. And both the co-chairs, me and Nadia, we also represent uh, uh, the Decade Collaborative Centers on the Coastal Resilience and the Indian Ocean region, respectively. And then it also helps us draw from the expertise, resources, and actions that these DCCs are involved. Uh, so we've had a meeting, a virtual meeting of the working groups, and then we've uh, we have been working electronically. Uh, we have actually done an analysis of the uh, long list of user needs that has already been carried out. Uh, and then uh, the most important thing yeah. with these hazards, uh, when we talk about multi-hazards is basically, you know, it actually spans a wide variety. For example, when we say geophysical, geological hazards, it could be tsunamis to landslides, to subsidence, to coastal erosion. And similarly, when we talk about ecological, it could be wet plant degradation, to acidification, to deoxygenation, loss of biodiversity. So what we actually did as a starting point was try to actually come up with you know, a definition of what are the kinds of hazards that we are going to address. So that has been done. So that has been at attempted. And then we also started actually putting together the key elements and components of coastal resilience. Uh, so the, the, the things that you see on the slide there, so these are the two important uh, components. One is to, to address or achieve the, uh, you know, challenge uh, objective of coastal resilience. One thing is to design. Right people-centered multi-hazard early warning systems that can actually address all the hazards that we're talking about. And then from there on, moving to design adaptation planning strategies to increase coastal resilience. That's at the other end. So these are the two important pillars. And then the early warning systems itself, there should be a large stakeholder engagement, sharing of responsibilities in running the systems, communication, which is accessible, and capacity building, of course, which runs across uh, all the pillars. And then use the information that we get, use the new data uh, from the ocean decade to prepare updated plans and solutions. Also in view of uh, you know, the, the discussion that we're having around marine spatial planning process and so on. Um, next slide, please, Nicolo. Okay, so here, uh, this is actually, these are the three important, uh, other three important elements uh, of the multi-hazard early warning systems end-to-end. -end. One is risk assessment, which is very important, uh, which actually, you know, needs information on observational evidences of both hazards and impacts. You need a lot of data sets there. You need historical data sets, you know, bathymetric and topographic data sets that, that enable you to do modeling and so on and so forth then model the data and then use techniques such as AI to, you know, to assess the impact of hazards. And then 
also have data on human activities, economic indicators across sectors. Uh, these things are very basic for the risk assessments uh, that we need to do. And of course, on the reduction part, again, early warning systems, which enable preparedness and response, warning communication, response procedures, and data. Uh, coming to the last one is go governance, which is uh, and institutional social uh, mechanisms, where we talk about marine spatial planning and equity across time and space uh, and uh, corporate social responsibility and so on. So these, uh, this information has been put together. It's actually a, a, a big text that we are currently, the working group is uh, working on. Um, and then uh, going forward from now on, we have actually... Uh, you know, we are collating the information from all the experts that we have on the working group on um, on the individual hazards uh, that they are uh, experts in, put, a, put together as brief text on the overview of the hazards, analyze the user needs and priorities for those particular hazards, look at what kind of data gaps are existing, what is the technology and innovation solutions that would be required by 2030, and then partnerships and resource requirements and interdependency with other decade challenges. So these are the inputs that we are actually putting together right now. Um, and then the co-chairs will be assembling a first draft of the white paper by November 20th. And then we'll be very happy to you know, have contributions uh, from all of you out there through the mechanisms that Nicole has uh, you know, mentioned before, or please feel free to write to me or Nadia. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola, and back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Srinivas, and thank you for showing us the progress on Working Group 6. Uh, we'll move to Working Group 7, uh, which is on Challenge 7, Expand the Global Ocean Observing System. And the two co-chairs are Patricia Miloslavic, Program Lead of the East Antarctic Monitoring Program of the Australia Antarctic Division, and Joe Callaghan, which is Director of Ocean Lee Science. Um, I think today Patricia in um, this session is with us, so please, Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicolo. Yes, I, I am here. So uh, hello, everyone. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, challenge seven of expanding the global ocean observing system on behalf of uh, the working group and the other uh, co-chair, Joe O'Callaghan. So working group uh, seven is about uh, making sure to ensure a sustainable ocean observing system across all ocean basins that delivers accessible, timely, and actionable data and information to all users. Can I have, please, the next slide, Nicolo? So, uh, sustained uh, long-term scientific observations of essential variables globally are critical to deliver the information needed to support climate forecasting, operational services, and ocean health. Uh, the current ocean observing system that we know benefits from data provided by a network of platforms, both in situ and remote, using a variety of sensors. The framework for ocean observing is multidisciplinary, aiming to measure essential physical, biochemical, and biological essential ocean variables that are impactful to address science question and societal needs. This working group will, bid, uh, will build in the foundation of the strategy of the Global Ocean Observing System, but we'll also build on the Ocean Ops 19 papers and the collection that is uh, reflected in frontiers of marine science of hundreds of papers, and also on the session recommendations of Ocean Ops. We will also build on the background documents that established the Decade Collaborative Center for Ocean Observance. We were the last group that was uh, established. We were established very recently, and as such, our progress has been a little bit delayed with uh, regards to the rest of the groups. So here we have in this slide, the current composition of the working group. Uh, these are members that have been already secured. We have 16 members from 10 countries representing all areas from physics to biochemistry, biology, but also policy, sustainability, data science, and uh, ocean observing coordination. Can I have the next slide, please, uh, Nicolo? Nicolo, can I have the, the next slide? Thanks. Uh, oh, no. So we, we had um, a first meeting uh, once we secured uh, the working group members. We had a first meeting just a week ago and um, we, uh, 
discussed about some background of the UN challenges and working group process and some cross-pollination with other working groups, also with the priorities for expansion of ocean observations and how we can use automated and low-cost options, having an integrative approach to try to make the best use of our investment. So when you put a platform out there, that that platform is able to measure and collect data across uh, several disciplines of co-designing with the different stakeholders about resourcing, which is always a challenge, and using the foundation of documents that I mentioned before. Uh, some of the recommendations that came from, from our first uh, discussions were that, uh, of course, this is a very high level drafting because uh, we only have 10 pages. So we need to really reflect on the priorities, being societal at the top and use uh, the goose delivery areas that I mentioned before. So climate, um, operational, uh, and uh, ocean health as a high level priorities. We should also focus not only on expanding the observance system, but also on securing and strengthening what we currently have, which is not a trivial thing to do. We also um, talked about articulating the importance of having best practices and standard operating procedures for all of the essential ocean variables that are fit for purpose, as well as uh, low cost options associated to these uh, standard operating procedures. We also took the approach that a new funding model will be required, expanding from the traditional funding sources, because currently the observing system is highly underfunded, at least to what we uh, would like it or our ambition is to be. So uh, we want to involve a representative of one of these financial sectors in the working group, and we're working on that. And we also, and this is really important because we have been hearing the other six working groups, all of them will require data to actually uh, overcome their challenges. And data comes from ocean observations. So we really will, uh, reach out to other working groups to learn what are their specific needs in terms of observational data to make sure that is incorporated as well into the uh, uh, white paper of working group seven. We will have our next call tomorrow and um, we have already assigned writing teams to each of the um, contents of the white paper. And uh, that's all I have to say right now. And thanks again very much for your attention. Please reach out with for ideas or to collaborate or uh, anything that you may want to share. Thanks. Thank you very much, Patricia, um, for showing the, the progress to date of Working Group 7. Uh, we'll move to Working Group 8. <clears throat> On Challenge 8, create a digital representation of the ocean. Uh, two co-chairs are Jan Bart uh, Kalevert, uh, lead manager of the Decade Coordination Office for Ocean uh, Data Sharing at IOC UNESCO, and um, Paula Cristina Sierra Correa, uh, coordinator of uh, the Marine and Coastal Research Institute, Jose Benito uh, Vives de Andres. Uh, I think Jan Bart is connected uh, this session. So please, Jan Bart, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicolo, and uh, good morning, afternoon, and good evening to all. Um, it's really a great pleasure to speak on behalf of the co-chairs and the working group for Challenge 8 on the progress and opportunities to contribute on the ambition setting for Challenge 8. And as you say, it's dealing with the creation of a digital representation of the ocean. And the implementation plan defines the challenge, as you can see on the screen, um, to develop a comprehensive digital representation of the ocean through multi-stakeholder collaboration, which includes a dynamic ocean map, providing free and open access for exploring, discovering, and visualizing past, current, and future ocean conditions in a manner relevant to diverse stakeholders. Now, because the term digital representation can have many interpretations, um, our working group um, looked at um, trying to clarify a little bit what this would mean in the context of the white paper um, and considers that it is not limited or does not mean a digital replica or digital twin ocean per se, but rather the collection of digital data and information about the past, current and future state of the ocean and related data and information, including socioeconomics, which allows us to generate a better understanding or picture of the ocean and various dynamics at different scales. Um, so in this context, uh, digital representation, we consider refers both to the ultimate end product, the maps, the forecast, time series, model outputs, or digital twin applications, 
but maybe most importantly to the underlying backbone digital resources, the system and processes that underpin and facilitate the creation of these end projects. And I think that's important to clarify a little bit what this uh, challenge is all about. Can I have the next slide, please? So who are we? Um, you can you can click a few times to have everything uh, rolled out. Thanks. So um, we are a working group uh, of sixteen members. As for the other working groups, quite diverse, uh, spread regionally and, and in terms of expertise. We also have a number of observers from IOC and the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange Program. Uh, and its component programs such as OBIS um, and the Ocean Data Information System. Um, we have been working since June of this year. We had a number of, of meetings jointly, um, as well as some subgroup drafting uh, meetings, all working towards um, developing a sort of background uh, document to the white paper, to inform the white paper which touched upon um, elements such as what do we really mean by digital representation of the ocean? What is the time frame for this strategic ambition setting? Who are our users? What do they really need? Uh, what content do we need to provide? What tools and services should be in place by 2030 and beyond? But also looking at what are uh, the needs from the other challenges, working groups uh, and actions um, that uh, will inform our ambitions for, for this particular challenge as it is a cross-cutting um, challenge. So um, in terms of how you can contribute or participate, there are many different ways, such as this webinar. There are many conferences that our members are participating to, uh, to collect further input. Uh, one particular uh, one that is maybe of interest is going to take place next week. It's the Dito Digital Twins of the Ocean Conference. It will take place in China, but also, I think, uh, largely online. Um, and then, of course, you can also get uh, directly in touch with us, the co-chairs, uh, Paula Sierra from Ivemar in uh, Colombia, myself, and the Decade Coordination Office for Ocean Data Sharing, which is supporting this working group. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at uh, where we are in the process towards our strategic ambition setting for this challenge. Um, when we look at uh, who are our users, I think very early on with the working group, we recognized that it's in fact because of the cross-cutting nature uh, of this challenge, we are serving everyone um, operating in the decade um, and beyond. Um, and in particular, uh, serving the thematic challenges, um, which we consider as our proxy users that can help us define the data information needs, both in content and services that uh, they need to resolve their uh, challenges. Um, so this is a very diverse uh, group, both in terms of uh, the thematic and the expertise and the, the knowledge they have in uh, handling data, the data literacy. You have professionals with hands-on experience. You have professionals uh, which do not have um, hands-on data handling experience. But we consider that also the, the broader public and non-professional stakeholders should be able to easily access all of the uh, data information that is being generated uh, by the decade uh, actions. So what do all of these um, users need? All of them need easy access to ocean data and information, which is multidisciplinary, and tools and services for accessing um, and sharing data information and knowledge in this digital ecosystem. And they need it um, using interfaces that are tailored to their needs and capacities, which is very diverse. In terms of um, uh, addressing those needs, we split it in two big components. On the one hand, um, we looked at what digital resources and what digital content is needed um, and what services uh, are needed uh, to serve these, uh, this content. So in terms of the digital content, um, we consider that it's, it's multidisciplinary, so including both socioeconomic data, um, environmental data, um, and uh, we looked at it from both sides. So first of all, it's very important that we already connect and unlock all of the data um, resources that exist and resides in thematic national and regional uh, data repositories and systems to an international or global um, interface. Uh, on the other hand, we also wanted to look at it um, from the prioritization of what we need in the decade. 
So we there is a, an, an, a strive within the a proposal within this working group to focus on that defining and selecting a number of priority data products, flagship products, if you like, like um, and uh, look at the underpinning data that is needed to develop those data products. So these global flagship data layers can be considered as drivers to pull in data to um, identify uh, data gaps, um, agree on standards and improve the interoperability that really serve as a pool. They will leverage existing communities working on, uh, on, uh, on decade actions to resolve the, the different challenges. They must be societally relevant, must be co-developed in a transparent process, um, and must be complemented, and that's very important. So we want to have um, a number of iconic data products that are delivered by um, the, the, the other thematic uh, challenges. One of them could be, for example, the um, seabed map that is being developed by the seabed 2030 program. But they must be accompanied by a number of local case studies with a high level of granularity and resolution where we really look at how data is being collected in the field, how data sharing barriers are being overcome, um, and how local knowledge in many cases is also being, uh, being shared. Then on the side of the services, we identified five particular um, service needs. First is to, um, to develop an operational global ocean discovery, data discovery and access service, which allows professional users to easily find, retrieve, visualize um, ocean data and information. There are uh, efforts already underway with the Ocean Data 2030 program uh, to develop this uh, operational service. The second is, um, and th this does not exist um, as of yet, only as a concept, to develop an online user-friendly digital atlas of the ocean, which is really something that everybody can use, even if you have very little data handling uh, capacity. Um, to access some of these key data project, products and layers uh, that are being produced uh, through the decade. Um, the third one is um, we need mechanisms for um, green knowledge exchange, so both access and sharing, to share, for example, best practices, uh, papers, reports, but also other solutions like application software, decision support systems. Um, the fourth is there is a, a need for some sort of a data help desk service, a permanent service that can be virtual and distributed where uh, decade actors that are in need of uh, data and information but don't know where to go or have issues with how they should manage and share their data, they can have expertise uh, and guidance on, uh, on how they can go about this. The fifth and final is to increase the data literacy um, by capacity development uh, and training. And uh, that would be working closely together with uh, the capacity development facility and um, the Ocean Teacher, Ocean Teacher Global Academy of, of IODE, for example. So um, what are the next steps? We are now engaging also with the other working groups to look at uh, globally relevant data products that can be delivered by the different decade actors. Um, we are elaborating the service ideas in the background document. We will be looking obviously on building on what exists already, um, identifying uh, existing best, best practices, looking at synergies with other working groups and involving relevant actions and programs in, um, in establishing the, uh, the goals and objectives of the, the white paper. And we look forward to uh, to your input and feedback. Um, and uh, voila, thank you. That's it, Nicolo. Thank you very much, Jan Bart, and for showing us the progress on working group eight. We'll move then to working group nine, which is on change nine, skills, knowledge, and technology for all. And two co-chairs are um, Brian Arbic, professor of oceanography at the University of Michigan, and uh, Eden Mao, a senior lecturer of marine biogeochemistry at the University of Ghana. Um, today, there is uh, Xin Lin, a member of the group, which will be representing working group nine. So Xin, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolo. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm Xin Lin, 
Associate Professor in Marine Biologist, and I'm from Shamyu University, China. I'm glad to be here to represent Working Group 9 to give this brief presentation about what have done so far and what's our next plan for the white paper writing. So our Working Group 9 is to address Challenge 9, is ensure comprehensive capacity development and equitable access to data, information, knowledge, and technology across all aspects of ocean science and for all stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. Nico? Ah, yeah. Uh, so we have a working group member finalized in the mid of July, and after that, throughout the process of the uh, writing white paper, members of working group nine uh, met regularly every two weeks, a Zoom meeting to discuss all the user needs and the inequities and also the solutions for challenge nine. So here is our progress uh, for the for the first, uh, we did a diagnosis of the current status. So currently the recognition, representation and the distribution of resources related to ocean science are, in, are, in equal, are unequal. Many coastal nations and communities are unable to participate fully in the global ocean science discussion and the results. And ocean science is often understood as natural scientific research, uh, which limits representation of different approaches to understanding ocean systems and human ocean interactions and marginalized traditional knowledge systems. So the overarching program is an uneven distribution of knowledge, infrastructure, and capacity. Addressing such an issue would allow all to participate in and benefit from the larger world view of ocean science. So underlying this are large difference in acknowledging, acknowledging the ocean's value and also the need for ocean science from the general public uh, education systems up to the higher echelons of government. And this contribute to the difference among countries in investing in ocean science and conservation. So we first identify the users uh, potentially need such a capacity building. So the users include governments and national and local uh, departments such uh, in regarding agriculture and fishery and agriculture and the water quality resources and also fish and wildlife management and also labor department, social science and health and also coast management as well. And another user, potential user, is educators from universities and experts in local customers' uh, traditional knowledge and shared communities of knowledge, and also aquarium. And also the users include communicators and investors and the scientific publishers and some uh, organizations as NGOs and the community organizations and local communities and also the other society groups. So this is the users we identified uh, first. And another progress we have so far here is we identified the key inequities that affecting the users and ability to meet their needs. So we generated a long list of these key inequities and uh, analyzed the needs, as you can see in the slide. So the key inequities here is the technology, uh, tech, uh, technological and technological and the digital divide. So this is the disparities in technological infrastructure, capacity, and resources between resourced and under-resourced countries can hinder access to the data and the knowledge. And about the infrastructure and the monitoring disparities is unequal distribution of ocean monitoring infrastructure such as buoys, satellite coverage, and research vessels, resulting in uneven data collection and also cause the gaps in knowledge. And also the third is the data access and ownership. Access to ocean data can be limited by the um, priority rights and the data exclusivity and the government policy. So making it difficult for researchers, governments, and local communities to use and build upon existing knowledge. 
And the fourth is the data quality and the standardization. Variability in data quality and the standards across different sources can impede effective knowledge integration and hinder the collaborative efforts in ocean science. And the fourth, and the fifth is the knowledge generation and use. An equitable distribution of knowledge use in the global north is confounded by inadequate representation of global South scientists in international journals, meetings, advisory panels, and planning committees. And the sixth is the gender and the diversity representation. Underrepresentation of women and marginalized communities in ocean science and related fields can lead to gaps in knowledge and perspectives, limiting the overall progress of ocean science. Additionally, addressing underrepresentation of social disciplines, practical and traditional knowledge, and diversity and inclusivity is often treated as an add on an unwanted task within the research proposals and meetings. And the seventh of the inequities is educational disparities. Unequal access to quality education and training in ocean science leads to disparities in capacity development. And the eighth is language and communication barriers. A dominance of English in scientific communication and the publication can create a barrier for researchers and stakeholders from non-English speaking regions, limiting or increasing the uh, budgetary needs for access to the latest research and advancements. And the ninth, for, the ninth is the funding and resource allocation. Inequitable distribution of funding and resources for ocean science research restricts capacity and development and employment opportunities in certain regions or for specific stakeholder groups and early career professionals. Insufficient or short-term financial support may limit research initiatives, technology adoption, capacity development, and et cetera. And the tenth is the political, uh, political and the policy barriers. Inconsistent policies and regulations regulations regarding data sharing, technique, technology transfer, transfer, research collaboration, and exclusion of scientists from the certain countries from international projects. Conferences, journals for political reasons hinder the international cooperation and limit the flow of information across borders. And the last of the inequality is the resource exploitation. Some island and coast countries and communities lack the capacity to protect their resources. For example, fish stocks or oil resources from over harvested by better funded entities that do not respect national borders on the sea. So to address these inequities, it's essential to promote the international cooperation, open data policies and inclusive capacity building programs. And oh. regarding such inequities, in uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, Xin, we need to move on. Um, I need to, I need to um, actually rush you because uh, we have two minutes left. Okay, okay. Next slide, please. I will get it done. So address the these key in inequities. We make it as our the key milestones to measure the progress and success in our working group nine. So this is the. Uh, indicators to addressing the following key adequacies in our next step. And also we have a draft for the white paper, uh, the white paper, and we have uh, a lot of notes put in from the group members. So we are assigning a right teams, writing teams to work that working together to finalize it. So that's all. All the comments and the suggestions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Xin. And um, let's move very quickly to working group 10, which is challenge 10 on change humanity's relationship with the ocean. Uh, two co-chairs are Diz Glitero, national lead of the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, and uh, Nicola Bridge, head of the Ocean Advocacy and Engagement of the Ocean Conservation Trust. We have today Judy Mann, a member of the working group, which will briefly go through this. But if you need to leave, Judy, I can I can step in. Thank you very much.
No problem. Good day, everyone. And thank you for waiting to the end for challenge 10, which I think is a very exciting challenge because it actually underpins challenges one to nine. So our challenge is change humanity's relationship with the ocean. And there we're looking at ensuring that the multiple values and services of the ocean for human well-being, for culture, and for sustainable, sustainable development are widely understood. And then we need to identify and overcome the barriers to, to the behavior change required for, for this change in humanity's relationship with the ocean. And listening to the other nine challenges, in six of them, it was explicitly mentioned social and behavioral challenges, human interactions with the ocean. We looked at ocean literacy, people-centered approaches were mentioned. So this challenge really underpins and informs all of the others. If we cannot change humanity's relationship with the ocean, all of the other challenges are going to be so much more difficult. If I can go to the next slide, please. So ultimately what we have taken for challenge 10 is we've summarized it into restoring humanity's relationship with the ocean, taking that humanity does have a deep relationship with the ocean to begin with, and we need to really restore that. Our strategic ambition is to create enabling conditions and environments that support humanity to have the motivation, the will to do it, the capability, the ability to do it, and the opportunity to behave in ways that ensure a healthy ocean. And our working group has spent many meetings discussing each of these words very, very carefully because each of these words has a different meaning to different people. And we want to make sure that this challenge 10 is as inclusive as possible. So what we're going to be doing is you'll see a question there. Does this high level ambition for 2030 resonate with you? Each member of our working group in the next month is going to be holding a webinar where we present much more detail about challenge 10. And we really ask for your input into challenge 10. If we can have the next slide, please. We are looking at this in multiple steps. And the first step is to look at what are the drivers of pro-ocean behavior? How do we help people to behave in a way that supports the ocean? And we've identified four key drivers. The first one is knowledge. And here we're looking at looking at different ways of knowing about human ocean interactions and actioning this knowledge across all sectors of society. And here we're aware that traditional Western science is only one way of knowing about the ocean. How do we harness indigenous knowledge? How do we harness other ways of knowing and use this to help build a connection between people and the ocean? Education, obviously another important one. How do we use formal education as well as informal experiential education to really build those connections? So how do we build up a community of educators and in using this as broadly as possible to build this connection with the ocean? How do we equip people from all sorts of different user groups with the tools and the skills and the knowledge to communicate clearly about the importance of ocean? We have incredible ability to connect people through different forms of communication, but how do we equip those communicators to inform people really, really accurately and effectively? And then how do we recognize the importance of intergenerational interactions with the ocean to inform cultural identity, social values and practices? And when we talk about the ocean here and the communities, we're referring to the ocean and local waterways, coastal areas, sea ice, etc. So we're looking at it in the most broad possible term. We're looking at barriers, enablers, and motivators. And then we're looking at some real actions that can take place on the ground. So this is where we'd like to appeal to all of you to, to join us at these webinars. We'll advertise them widely. Let us know if you'd like to come to a webinar so you can can help us to craft this white paper in a way that really resonates and is effective with actions that everyone can use. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Judy, um, for bringing us through the work of Working Group 10. Um, since we are running very late um, on, on this uh, webinar, unfortunately, we cannot run the Q&A session as we wished, but um, many questions have been coming through the question, the Q&A um, um, feature here in Zoom, and we answered uh, most of them. But if you have any additional question, please include them in the Q&A feature. We are happy to answer them also um, offline. Um, many questions were regarding how to get engaged and um, how to join the working groups. The working groups are formed now, but there are many other ways to engage as the co-chairs um, showed. So um, you can have more information on the uh, Vision 2030 um, website and uh, the link was shared in the chat. So please feel free um, also to visit the, the, um, the website and see how to engage. There, the, there are the information of all the co-chairs and all the working groups. Other information were regarding the Barcelona conference and the link on the on the chat is towards the Barcelona conference and more information can be found there. Um, and for any other information, I'll share also uh, my personal email in, um, in the chat so that if you have any questions or if you need to reach out to any of the co-chairs, I can be the, uh, the link towards this. Um, but as a quick wrap up, well, first of all, I would like to thank all the um, co-chairs and the members of the working group uh, that have participated in this uh, first session of the webinar uh, and all the attendees. Of course, we are very happy of having um, this much interest in the process. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out for any further engagement in the process. We've we've uh, gone through different um um, challenges, uh, very diverse also. So starting from one to 10, um, being very diverse between each other. Um, but some good um, key takeaways were brought from this, uh, this webinar in terms of progress and in terms of how to engage also with the different working groups. Um, again, additional resources are on the Vision 2030 webpage on the Ocean Decade Conference uh, website. Um, and of course, we call for an active participation in the Vision 2030 process. Um, feel free to reach out to, um, to me or the um, co-chairs to understand how um, you can be engaged either through the consultation, um, direct and consultation or the open review process. And there will be a second uh, public webinar in February to deal more with the uh, final contents of the white papers. Um, the link, we'll, we'll share again the link in the, um, in the chat. Um, and then um, we'll answer all the questions that are coming in um, uh, again. And uh, uh, we'll try to, um, to also um, have all of this available online. The registration of the webinar will be available online and uh, um, any other question will be followed up uh, eventually individually. Um, thank you very much again to everyone. Uh, and uh, if you want, you can connect also to the second session uh, this afternoon at five uh, Central European time. Thanks again.